Hello and welcome to Bloomberg Screen Time. I'm Caroline Hyde. And I'm Ed Ludlow. We're living through one of the most disruptive transformations in entertainment and pop culture. With storied Hollywood studios going head to head with technology giants like Netflix, Amazon and Apple and actors and writers striking for a bigger piece of the streaming pie and to protect against artificial intelligence. Bloomberg Screen Time brought together media moguls, celebrities and entrepreneurs who are influencing the next phase of pop culture. Now, while streaming and social media apps like, well, TikTok, they've upended how Hollywood does business. Some things, they remain the same. So let's start with Ari Emanuel, Endeavor and TKO CEO. He spoke with Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw on his deal to merge USC and WWE and the future of sports. Now, on the sports rights front, a lot of this is predicated on that market keep continuing to yeah. increase. Yeah. That has been ballooning for a long, long time. Right. Given what you're seeing with the kind of continued collapse of TV, um, the way that some- Okay, the, 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 I'm not gonna interrupt you, okay? Yeah, the NFL well, you know made a 10 going. year deal with linear television, 10 years, okay? The linear business is not going anywhere. They've also made deals on digital. We did the same thing, ESPN, ESPN Plus on the USC side. WWE did, Peacock, uh, Showtime, I mean, um, uh, USA Network, um, and Fox, which is whatever. So the, 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 the linear business is not going anywhere. The sports business is moving and in in, in, is going to figure itself out between digital and linear. It's an unbelievably healthy market. They all have to be in it. They all want to be, every single one of the players want to be in it because of the audience. We have two assets in the sports business that don't have a, are year long, don't have a season. I don't believe prices are going down. You're gonna figure out the bifurcation of the rights and give things up, not give things up. How, I mean, how long do you think it is before Netflix actually jumps into sports? You know, they're in sports right now, but they just do the shoulder programming. Yeah. Um, I think their point of view, and you'll ask Ted tomorrow, is we build up the, we don't want to be in the bidding of, of rights and then not have any long tail. So I'm not sure. I, they did bid uh, on Formula One, and Buddy yep. ESPN got it. So I, I think that was a smaller package, meaning smaller economics. So we'll see. So generally speaking, um, box office is down globally around 20% to 2019, so pre-pandemic levels. But this summer, it was 5% down, right? So it would suggest that um, even though there were winners and losers of this summer, and obviously we had the two big juggernauts with Bobby and Oppenheimer, um, you know, movie going begets movie going, right? So when there's a, a good a, a season filled with you know, good movies that people want to see. You know, I, I was I was pretty I was made to feel pretty optimistic about what we what we saw in the summer. What you you mentioned Oppenheimer? Uh, we can talk about Barbie, although that's not one of your movies. Your two big movies of the year were Mario yeah. and Oppenheimer. Which of those was a bigger surprise to you? Um, I, I think probably Oppenheimer. You know, I mean, an R-rated film. Um, with that subject matter, and uh, you know, at, at the at the at the running time, and it, it, I wasn't surprised that it was successful, right? I mean, it's Christopher Nolan. We know that he is a singular filmmaker who audiences globally really want to go see, but I was really surprised at um, at the sort of the breadth of the audience, the demographic. It skewed from you know from young from you know young kids, to, not young kids, but teenagers all the way up to you know, an older audience. So it was, uh, it was pretty surprising. Do you feel like the success of Oppenheimer says anything about the business, or is it the case that Chris Nolan and Quentin Tarantino seem like two filmmakers where if they make a movie, they're like a brand, right? Even if they're original, people yeah. will show up to see them. I think in the case of Christopher Nolan, he makes films for the big screen and really for the big screen only. Of course, you can watch a Christopher Nolan movie at home and eventually you'll be able to do that. 
But, um, you know, he, he, I mean, everything he does from shooting on IMAX to, you know, uh, to, to 70 millimeter, to the way that, you know, he really encourage his films encourage audiences to experience his films on IMAX screens and in the large format. I think it all speaks to, um, again, I use that word, a sort of singular cinematic experience. You know what you're going to get. You, not subject matter wise, but you know you're going to get a very fulfilling experience at the movie theater, and um, and, and and sort of quite frankly, value value for your money. If you were Bob Iger, what would you do at ESPN? I would sell it. To who? I would sell it to uh, Apple, and Apple could take their entire budget for two episodes of the morning show <laughs> and pay it for ESPN. And I think that makes a lot of sense. They could be like, you know what, maybe we don't need to launch a rocket in outer space in episode one. We'll just buy ESPN <laughs> instead. And that'll be it. Um, related question, uh, regional sports networks. There's a lot of, it's a business that seems to be collapsing. Leagues have sort of toyed around with, should yeah. we do something our, our ourselves? Some teams are doing like local TV and streaming. How do you see that shaking out? So. I don't think I'm right on this, but this is, my instincts keep telling me this is what's going to happen. Because if you remember the WWE, they launched their own network that had their own content and had their own pay-per-views. And it was kind of a smart, bold, ahead of its time move. And then they pivoted at the perfect time and they sold their content to, what was it, Peacock. Peacock. Yeah. And that was really smart too because they were able to leverage that number as high as possible. So they always zagged where the money was when the opportunity was. I think the opportunity for the NBA with the local teams would be to own all that themselves and own league pass themselves and do it in a way that they could just basically own all of it. And I don't know if they'll do that or they'll have the to do it, but they, you know, with the media rights deal that they're going to get from the national games, um, they're going to make so much money and the players are going to be paid so much money. Like we're going to have guys making 75, 80 million a year. So if there was ever a time for them to kind of bet on themselves, that's the league to do it. There's all this mystery around what, what is success in streaming. It's engagement. It is how much time do people spend on the service because that tells you how much they'll pay and how long they'll stick around. What are the metrics for Netflix that are most important when evaluating a show you, or a movie? Yeah, you guys take us to task a lot on this transparency issue. I, I would say, look, definitely relative to peers, we're incredibly transparent. Uh, and we're completely transparent with our producers so they know exactly uh, the, the viewing data. Uh, and then we're going you know, through things like the top 10 and through things like we publish the uh, viewing hours uh, of the top shows. And we're definitely hendi heading towards a much more transparent time in the business. The streaming itself is not that exotic anymore. And every other segment of the business does have you know, Nielsen ratings or box office reports or the New York Times bestseller list, all those things. So we're heading towards that for sure. We are to a moment, to a time we'll be fully transparent on viewing data. Does that mean it's, um, sorry, go ahead. You know, no, it's safe. so that will demystify this for a lot of people, which is basically what I can care about the most is relative to what it costs to put on the air, are people watching? And when they push play, do they stay? So if they push play and then drop out in the second or third ep season, right. or third which is completion show, rate for. Yeah, 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 so those things all matter, but they all add up to the same thing, which is engagement. So I think you can, all the data is really there. You might have to triangulate it a little bit to get to it, but all the data is really there. What was the, the toughest cancellation decision you've had recently? They're, they're all tough. You know, the reason why, because I think the people have got uh, a real fandom. They really love these. Some people really love all these shows, even if, the re even if the rest of the world doesn't agree with them. So for them, that's why you see sometimes these very obscure shows, and you hear very loud campaigns about stop the cancellations, because they have such an intense relationship with it. That's why I love this business so much. I, a, I relate to it. A lot of Sometimes my personal taste is really far outside of the outside of the norm, and I just what I've been decent at over the years, and 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 pick people who are good at doing this. Uh, but when I look at it, I think it's you know some of it was programming to my taste. We'd be very small. Uh, so, but if I'm so we're trying to program to the to the world's taste. Um, but they're all hard. They really are all difficult decisions to make because people love these shows so much, and 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 you know there's so some some things are just a puzzle. You scratch your head, but relative to what it costs to put on the air. You know, did we pick a good show? Did we execute on it well? And did we pay the right price to make it? 
Coming up, Padma Lakshmi on elevating food across screens. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Screen Time. I'm Caroline Hyde. You know Padma Lakshmi from her two decades hosting Top Chef. I spoke with her about her new show, Taste the Nation, and how she created a show highlighting the immigrant and indigenous experiences creating American food. Yes, Taste the Nation is really a political show. You know, it's just a Did you mean it to be? Or yes, it's very, yes. I mean, I meant for you to see and not see everything you saw and not saw <laughs> in Taste the Nation. I mean, as much as I am in front of the camera on that show, most of the work that I do on that show is behind the camera yes. with our stories, with our episode producers, with our research, um, writing the you know voiceover, all of it. And I think that's been a real um, gift to be able to hone muscles I didn't know I had, didn't know I wanted. Um, and it's very gratifying. It's always really a privilege and it's, you just feel so lucky to be able to um, have an interest and a keen passion about something and then actually be able to do it at work, yeah. at the level that you want to do. Um, and I think that to me has been the greatest um, gift that Top Chef has given me because I would never have Taste the Nation if I hadn't helped build Top Chef. And while Taste the Nation may be more aligned with my own interests or you know, my own vision or taste level, Top Chef is also something that I'm really proud of as far as um, you know, what we've done in television and what we've done in food, uh, and also what we've done just to affect how a generation of young people around the world, not just in America, think about their food. How do you go and sell those stories? Whose ear do you need to, to gravitate towards or call towards you to, to say this is, it needs to go on Hulu and it needs to go on in this particular manner and how? How do I sell it? Well, I mean, I do a lot of things like this, but <laughs> I mean, not that much, but I, 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 think, I think good programming finds its way. I mean, I sell it through building my social media platform. Like I enjoy social media, but I don't have something to say every day, you know, yeah. but I have to post every day. And so I'm learning how to do that. Does and that frustrate you? It, it's time consuming. Yeah. It, listen, for me, ta um, social media has been a very, very effective tool, not only to tell you about books that I've written or shows that I'm passionate about, but also to do my advocacy work. Yes. Um, whether it's with the United Nations or ACLU or Planned Parenthood or whatever. So. For me, it was a megaphone that allowed me to talk about women's reproductive health. It was a megaphone that let me find my audience. I think it's really good for that because it's a way for you to communicate directly with the people who you think are your potential audience. Just looking at your portfolio of businesses, it is about resilience, it's mm -hmm. about pressure, it's about women. Like, yes. how, So how does that come together in in how does it manifest in the deals that you're doing now? Yeah, um, it, it's one of the things that I became increasingly passionate about after, after I retired was acknowledging the fact that focus and this performance mindset was a huge asset that I had gained and that I had worked on and perfected for over 20 years. And now working through brands and founders, um, I just recently announced a collaboration with the Amman Hotel Group where I bring in the best talents in, in sports recovery and performance mindset um, in retreats and offering it there to their clientele. Our first one um, is actually in, in Phuket in February. So working through what that means, I mean, if you see the stats of Fortune 500 um, female CEOs, 80% of those women um, have played sport competitively mm. through their life journey. And all those skill sets that they've built, to me, they were part of this first chapter, right? But how do they now apply to everything else I'm doing? And I'm, I'm so curious and interested in how I can bring that um, to the audience now and, and make it more mainstream and, um, and accessible. But as we've grown over the last couple of decades, I think that we really do want to do things that we completely uh, enjoy mm. and that makes sense and that we're passionate about. 
you know, because it, it's very difficult to do something that you're really not that into. So I think my job is to identify a company or a product or a business and then build, helping to build the team that's around that. Yeah. It's like with Skims, for example, I can use that. Um, Kim thought about doing a shapewear company for 10 years. And Kim and I were in Cannes, and she was with Kendall, and they were going to do the red carpet. And I went up to get Kim, and she was leaning over a bathtub filled with warm water and tea bags, and she was dyeing her underwear and cutting it up. And I said, what are you doing? You've got to be downstairs in 10 minutes. You know, she goes, I've got it, and they're blow drying the stuff. She goes, this is just really what I want to do. And she did that for years. And then, you know, suddenly it was time to start this business. And so I asked the partners that we have now in Skims to come on board. Would they like to help us manufacture? Because I knew how to make makeup and yeah. beauty. I wasn't sure exactly how to make shapewear. You know, so I knew I had to find somebody who was great at uh, manufacturing clothing and running that kind of a company. So I think that's a good example of how we are, you know, our ecosystem and our process works, mm. you know, we identify a business, we, you know, get it funded and try to get it off the ground and then we find the best team of people to put around that company. The uh, sale of ABC stations. Yeah. I was about ABC to... net stations and network. Correct. Just, yeah. And you're, have you already submitted a bid or you're looking to uh, submit a bid? Well, I submitted a bid. I texted it to Bob. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bob was on CNN. I'm sorry. He was on some other network. And Bob said uh, he didn't see, uh, you know, linear networks as being core. Yeah. I said, got my mobile phone and said, here you go. And uh, it was very straightforward. It's like, hey, whatever your EBITDA is, because, you know, I'm willing to pay you an 8x. So just open the books. Let's go. But they're not ready to sell. He's not ready to sell. But I wanted to make it clear. Why do, you say, why do you say he's not ready to sell? Well, they've made that statement. They're not there. That's a complicated thing. They have to bifurcate that. Mm -hmm. They have to pull that out of the Disney system. That's a tough thing to do. And Bob is brilliant. He's excellent at what he does. When he's ready to sell, I just told him, you don't need to make more than one phone call. I'm your man. Call me. <laughs> Everybody else is a waste of time. Call me. I'll get it done. What you want? And also, so, too you, know, you know, bottom, listen, the money is easy. The money is very easy. There's plenty of money. There's $80 trillion out there floating around looking for you know, great management. That's the real commodity. Great management. That's the commodity, right? There's, there's $80 trillion out there. You don't have $80 trillion Byron Allen's. Mm -hmm. Okay, you want your money back with a return? Call me. All right? also too, so right. I said to Bob, right, just to be really clear, Go ahead. I'm ready when you are, but it's not about the money. It's about certainty of close. And very few people can get a deal like that. ABC News, get that approved in Washington, DC. And what you don't want to do is go sell it to somebody that can't get the deal closed, and now you're walking around in adult diapers for a year. Coming up, how gaming is changing the face of entertainment. This has been that. Welcome back to Bloomberg Screen Time. I'm Ed Ludlow. Video game adaptations have been having a moment from the Super Mario Brothers movie to HBO's The Last of Us. I spoke with Helen Chiang, Minecraft franchise head, and Brian Wright, Riot Games Chief Content Officer, on how video game IP is going to make the next leap from the gaming screen to the silver screen. Yeah, I think gaming and entertainment go hand in hand. You know, when Minecraft started, it was a small independent game. It's evolved into a multi-billion dollar franchise. We're really excited to expand into entertainment because um, we think of it as a great opportunity to reach new audiences and bring them into the franchise even if they're not going to play the game. There is a Minecraft movie. Well, let, there is a Minecraft movie. There is. Please expand. <laughs> um, it's under production right now. Um, we're really excited to be working with Warner Brothers. Um, we have the Movie it's upcoming, it, we're working with Jason Momoa. Um, it's a little bit delayed right now because of yes. all of everything that's going on. And that's largely because of the pandemic. <laughs> Definitely. 
Please continue. Um, <laughs> but we're really excited because I think it's going to be um, just another expression of Minecraft that brings in a whole new audience into the franchise. We're hoping it's the start of many different entertainment offerings that we'll have with Minecraft. It is the idea that whatever the, the end result that the movie looks like, that it's recognizable to kind of the generations of players that were playing Minecraft across different mediums? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think one of the challenges that we've had is, you know, Minecraft isn't known for the highest fidelity graphics. Um, so as we were trying to imagine what the art style for this movie was, you know, I just saw um, some creative of that this week. I think we're really excited, and I think our um, fans are going to well, be Well, Jason Momoa might not sign on if you pixelate his face. <laughs> uh, but you've been through this, well, I'm, I'm assuming, I, I mean, I'm not an actor, but y you've been through this process with Arcane. So, so he Helen's going through it now. You've published, essentially. Uh, what was your learning from that, taking League of Legends and doing that? Yeah, you know, it was interesting. And there was a lot of nerves at Riot pre-launch of Arcane because, you know, it was highly anticipated. They'd spent six years making it. Um, and there's an extremely sort of like obsession with excellence at the company. But they didn't know, obviously, how it was going to land until it's out there in the world. And the, um, the response was overwhelming. The player community just like lost their minds. And the way to answer your question, just one, one question ago, which is like, what do I think makes for a good adaptation? Yes. Um, for me, it really all comes back to character. And, um, and that's what Christian and Alex who created, you know, they were actually rioters, internal guys. Um, one was from the champion team, one was on the music team, and they, they actually created Arcane. But they, they found, they, they focused the spotlight on a couple of champions, uh, which we, we call them champions, their characters, Jinx and Vi, really at the center of this thing. And um, they're not just like running around, like blowing up things for the sake of blowing up things. Like there's reasons, like deep, deep seated personal reasons. There's a story. There's a story. But the story didn't necessarily, you know, ours, ours is not a narrative game. Right, unlike Naughty Dog, like Last of Us, that's a narrative game. Like League of Legends is a five-on-five -five MOBA. It's a forty-five-minute fantasy basketball matchup, right? So, um, but we do have supporting literature and supporting website and short stories that we publish that to give you a sense more of like these what these characters and champions are up to. But so, like, but they had a lot of license to go create that story and create that narrative. Um, but they stayed deeply authentic to who those champions were. Gaming and gamers have been probably one of our oldest uh, and, you know, for the longest time, most important verticals on our platform, including esports, but really across the full gamut there. Um, a lot of what is consumed there is, you know, video on demand, which is kind of the core essence of our YouTube platform. Uh, but increasingly, a lot of that is live. And our, our investment there has been uh, twofold. One is distribution to so make sure that you know esports gamers or gamers in general or live streamers even more broadly um, have access to audiences that they can easily be, be discovered if you are a fan and one of your favorite esports or gamers uh, is going live we should be able to find it and then the second is monetization capabilities so um, insertion of ads and things like that that's been a priority for us but also alternative monetization so our investment in things like super chat super stickers descriptions all yeah that. channel memberships channel gifting has actually a lot of it has been born out of and driven through the gaming community and that's all from Bloomberg Screen Time. You can find full interviews and panel discussions at Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg Terminal. I'm Caroline Hyde. I'm Ed Ludlow, and this is Bloomberg.